Hello, welcome again to this uh, video on quantum mechanics. Today we'll make the transition from um, quantum mechanics and in particular wave mechanics in one dimension to wave mechanics in three dimensions. And it's uh, a fairly straightforward extension. Um, so we'll move from our one dimensional operators of position X and momentum P, which satisfy our canonical commutation relations and are defined on our space L2 over R on our Hilbert space L2 over R, we'll move from this system to a three-dimensional system where we now have a vector R, a vector momentum P, um, and or canonical commutation relations now pick up a Kronecker delta because uh, um, the, uh, the, the different um, X, Y, and Z directions commute with each other. This will now be defined on a tensor product space a tensor product Hilbert space of the X Hilbert space, the Y Hilbert space, and the Z Hilbert space. So in, in some sense, the X operator in our one dimensional case is the tensor product of the operator X with then the identity operator on Y and the identity operator on Z. Okay. In our one dimensional case, we had our uh, uh, basis states phi N, which were functions of X. Really, these are projections of the state of the basis state phi on the uh, eigenfunction or eigenvectors x of this Hilbert space. So we'll extend that now to a, uh, a basis state that now has three indices, n, m, and l, where we have a basis in uh, along the x direction, a basis in the y, and a basis in the z direction. So this is the tensor product of phi n, phi m, and phi l. And of course, um, not every state that is part of our tensor product Hilbert space is also a can be written as a tensor product on its own, but this basis will allow us to describe all of the Hilbert space states in our tensor product space. We could of course also have used a different basis in, in Y and Z, um, or we could have used an R theta phi description as well in terms of three different um, uh, variables. So in general, a state psi or wave function in three dimensions phi, psi that depends on x, y, and z will not be able to be written as um, a, a separable uh, function as a state that is a, a tensor product of an x-dependent part, a tensor product of a y-dependent part with a, a z-dependent part. So instead what we'll have to do is we'll have to write our psi as a basis with um, or prefactors or coefficient c um, sub nml and then our basis vectors. And of course, c nml will be given by our um, overlap integral here uh, between our, our psi, the wave function itself, and then the basis states that we're projecting on. Now, of course, um, there's, there's many things that just translate from our one dimensional to our three dimensional system. So we again have pseudo eigenstates of R, those are our cats R. Now they're vectors. The completeness relation becomes a three-dimensional integral over all of space. So we'll have our projection operator on R here, and then we'll integrate over R over all of space, and that will have to be an identity operator. Probability amplitudes for a state phi um, projected on a eigenstate R will give us our, our function, or our wave function phi, that now depends on the vector R instead of just a single coordinate x. If we take the modulus of this probability amplitude, now we multiply it with our infinitesimal volume element d3r, then that will give us the probability to find um, a particle in this, uh, in, in this element d3r around the vector r. Um, if we look at this in an operator formalism, so the operator r on phi um, projected into a wave function will give us uh, will be defined as the vector r multiplied with the wave function. So as you can see, of course, the vector on the left-hand side, vector on the right-hand side. And of course, for the momentum, we have something similar. So the momentum on phi um, written as a wave function will be minus i h bar. And now instead of a single derivative, we have three derivatives um, in this gradient of phi. Okay, um, we can move from our representation in r to a representation in p. Um, just as we did earlier from X to P, um, this will be a Fourier transform now because we have a three-dimensional integral. We pick up three factors of one over two pi h bar 
um, with a square root. So we get our, our prefactor of one over two pi h bar to the power three halves. And then we integrate over our Fourier kernel here with phi um, now dependent on, uh, on a vector r. And then finally, for the Hamiltonian, um, in the absence of any magnetic field, so uh, remember that we did have an additional term that uh, could be added here to the momentum that described our vector potential, but we'll leave that out for now, and we can do that in the absence of a magnetic field. So we'll be able to write our Hamiltonian in this form. Okay. Um, we'll show later uh, what happens if we are working in uh, with a magnetic field um, or uh, um, when we have to use this uh, this factor A. Okay, good. Um, now, what does that mean for our Schrodinger equation? So, first of all, the time-independent Schrodinger equation, um, which really just follows from the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, but whatever, I have them in a different order here. So, we have our, um, our kinetic energy and our potential energy term here. Uh, so we're looking for eigenfunctions, and uh, the eigenvalue will be um, this energy E uh, in terms of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Uh, we get our time derivative here. Now for static solutions, phi will be related to, to phi that, doesn't, that isn't time-dependent with um, E to the, um, with an exponential with the energy. And so that's, of course, why we um, will recover this time-independent right hand side we can introduce our probability currents or fluxes as i mentioned this is called sometimes so the probability current is now the real part of h bar over i m phi star gradient of phi and that again satisfies the continuity equation where um the time derivative of the the density of uh, the, the probability density will be um will have to change the, the, the probability density will have to change with time um, due to the probability currents flowing in and out of the volume element or the volume that we're integrating over. And of course, the probability density is the square of the, um, the probability amplitude, modulus squared of the probability amplitude. So let's look at a specific example, um, extending or treatment of the one-dimensional infinite square well. Um, so now we, we're looking at a uh, a square well that's, that has a width Lx, Ly, and Lz in the x, y, and z direction. So remember, in one dimension, and I think we used um, L, uh, we, we uh, wrote that as A, but of course that remains the same. So our, our solutions there were 2 over L with a square root times the sine of Kn times x, and Kn was any of a discrete number of values for this wave number, pi over L times n plus 1. Where n plus one, where n can go from zero um, to any of the, the positive integers. Uh, we don't need to include the negative integers here, because we'll just pick, we'll just look at, uh, at negative values of k sub n. Negative values of k sub n through the sine will just change the sine on phi, which really just con um, corresponds to a phase chain, is, and and is not observable because we take the square of the uh, of the amplitude. The energy in this case is just h bar squared over 2m times or k squared, so that will give us our n plus 1 squared. Okay. Um, one of the things that will be interesting to look at, um, and I'll do that um, in, in the next video, is uh, the, the energy, um, the, the level density of, uh, of these systems. So in this case, what is the, the level density in this one-dimensional case is the number of energy levels delta n or the increase in the number of energy levels delta n um, for an increase in k that is given by delta k. So if we're at a wave number k and we increase to del by delta k, what's our change in n that will be delta n? And in this case, if we go, um, if we increase n by del, if we increase k by delta um, k, then n will have to increase by delta n related with this pi over l, or delta n is l over pi times delta k. So that's how our level density, um, our number of levels is related to the number, uh, to the, the change in, um, in the wave number k. And uh, well, we're kind of making the assumption here that n and k both behave as, as continuous variables. Of course, delta n and delta k um, will not be related um, in this way for uh, for the discrete values of n, but we're making a continuous uh, an extension to continuous variables here. 
So now let's do this uh, infinite square well in three dimensions. So the way this extends now is or phi um, just becomes uh, a product of uh, the solutions in the four in, in the three dimensions. So we have a solution in the x direction, solution in the y direction, and solution in the z direction. So this is um, the same as what I what I talked about just a few minutes ago, where we take our part in our um, first Hilbert space or first one dimensional Hilbert space. We take the tensor product with the part in the second Hilbert space, and then we take the tensor product with the part in the third um, Hilbert space. And our factors of 2 over L um, combine in this 8 over the product of all of the, the widths. The energy is now given by the sum of squares. So we'll get a, a, a part of the energy that comes from the x direction, from the y direction, and from the z direction. And so the next thing we'll do is we'll look at this in a little bit more detail and also um, have a discussion about these, uh, the number of energy levels and the level density in this system, um, but that will be for the next video.